Well, tonight we've got a fascinating live interview uh, with Nick Dearden from Global Justice Now. So please do, at any point, drop in your questions. Nick and I had a chat uh, offline there, and we're going to try and bring them in as soon as we can to make sure we cover all your questions. Well, tonight, Nick's joined us, and we're going to talk in general about financial services regulation, but specifically, we're going to talk about something called the Edinburgh reforms. Now, these are a set of reforms announced to drive growth and competitiveness, uh, competitiveness in the financial services sector. Now, the government, the UK government's ambition is to be the world's most innovative and competitive global financial centre. The Chancellor highlighted financial services as one of the five key growth sectors for the UK economy. Now, the UK government press release continues. This builds on the government's vision for financial services as set out in the Chancellor's speech in 2021 for an open, sustainable and technologically advanced financial services sector that is globally competitive and acts in the interests of communities and citizens, creating jobs, supporting businesses, powering growth across all of the four nations. Now, doesn't that sound wonderful? Uh, Nick's going to look at a little bit of detail of whether or not that's actually likely to happen. And um, before I do that, we've got a quote from um, Stuart Hosey, who is the SNP's economic spokesperson, and he's also our keynote address on the Saturday or at our Festival of Economics in Dundee. Um, and Stuart says, deregulation and a lifting of the cap on bankers' bonuses are the last thing we need to see right now. Offering up another insight into the warped policies of a Tory party who've just taken a wrecking ball to the UK economy and household finances. The economic chaos created at Westminster is a cost to the people of Scotland can no longer afford, demonstrating exactly why we need a, par a permanent escape with full powers of independence. So I think that gives you a good flavour of what Stuart's going to be covering at his session at the Festival of Economics. So to discuss all this, I'd like to welcome first uh, Nick Dearden. Thanks very much. Hi, Nick. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Fantastic. I'll see if I can bring Kieran on again. Hi, Kieran. Is it better? Yeah, that's a little bit better. That's a little bit better. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for joining us. Uh, Kieran, are you everything okay with you? Busy week so far? We, we have a by election, so yeah, it's always busy now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, well, and, and budget coming up as well. So yeah, there's lots, lots to do, and full council soon as well. Yeah. Super busy. Well, I hope I know you'll be busy. I hope you can. I hope you can stay with us for this. Um, Nick, I gave a little introduction there. Is there anything you want to add to that introduction before we start banging through these questions that we've got? No, I think that's all good. Uh, I mean, yeah, you, you said I'm from a campaign group, Global Justice Now, and we campaign on all sorts of ways that the global economy um, is bad for people around the world, creates poverty and inequality um, and conflict and climate change. Um, but also, as I think we're going to want to discuss, is, is really bad for people um, here in the UK too. OK, fantastic. Um, so that, that's a little summary of what Global Justice Now does. What made you hone in on financial services regulation? Because that seems like something, you know, maybe a lot of people would think is a bit obscure considering these other huge issues that you're looking to target. Yeah, it seems a bit dry, doesn't it, sometimes? And I think our, our job is to convince people it's not. Um, Look, I've, I've been working on kind of global inequality and global poverty issues for about 25 years. And one of the things I learned a long time ago is one of the main ways that this country um, and its governments over the years um, have created and exacerbated problems around the world is through our financial sector. I mean, go, go right back to the 1950s when um, the British Empire was collapsing around the world and states were winning their freedom um, and Britain thought how can we retain a powerful position in the world through which you know we have some degree of control over countries around the world but also um, we allow our businesses to extract wealth and resources from countries around the world in a way we're not going to be able to do directly anymore and they hit upon finance as the key way that they were going to do that and, and ever since we've seen the way that the British financial sector um, creates havoc around the world. I mean, pulls resource and wealth um, out of other places in the world um, and invests them in the bank accounts of some of the biggest corporations that are invested in this country and British elites um, and so on. So, you know, for me, that's always been, or, you know, for as long as I've been working in this kind of area, it's been a concern for me. I think what we then saw go back to 2007, 2008, 
Um, and many of us will remember the absolute catastrophe um, that deregulated finance created on our own society. I, I believe we're still living with the consequences of that um, very, very firmly in terms of our broken political system and so on. Um, and it became really, really clear that finance isn't just something that kind of operates over here according to a kind of arcane and, 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 and dry set of rules. It's absolutely central um, to the, the, the way our society operates. And not just globally or not just nationally, but also globally. So when we're looking at these regulations, we have to have a much wider perspective than just how does it impact the UK because of the role of the UK financial services in this kind of, I think it's at the heart of the spider's web in terms of money laundering and corruption and all these other areas as well. Well, I'm, 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 I'm sure people can start to see the connection there um, between these huge issues, inequality, poverty, global justice and, and the financial services. So um, let's, so you're doing a lot of work on financial services regulation. Let's start with uh, the, the premise or the question, what's wrong with the way that the UK financial services in particular are structured at the moment? So I would say there's a myriad of problems. One of them is that financial services play too big a role in our economy. Um, and that means um, you know, there's, there's an old idea that you know countries that suddenly hit oil um, become very wealthy on the back of that oil, but it's also a curse in many ways for them, this idea of a resource, resource curse, because increasingly it drains every other part of society and every part of the other economy into um, that central industry. And, you know, guys like John Christensen from the Tax Justice Network a long time ago said finance plays the same role in our economy. It, it draws the best and the brightest. It draws so many um, resources that could otherwise be stimulating other parts of our society, other parts of our economy into it. So it helps that incredible centralization of the British economy, that incredible inequality, um, which has dogged us as a country for a long time now. And, and as I say, I think has led to a kind of, a kind of collapse in our, in our politics, at least at a UK level. Um, so I think that's a, an enormous problem for us. And, 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 and what that also does is mean that the, the tail went, ends up wagging the dog if you like, that because the British government keeps saying, well, the financial industry is, is the, the jewel in the crown of our economy, we must give them what they want. And of course, what they want is lower regulation. What they want is to be able to do more of whatever it is that they think they need to do in order to make money and retain more of that money in their own pockets. Now, the problem there is, as soon as you start deregulating the financial sector, that creates the potential for crisis and chaos for the rest of us. So it isn't just the low level seeping of resources into this single sector, um, seeping of talent um, into this single sector. It also, this sector itself becomes incredibly unstable um, and begins seriously impacting upon lots of other areas of society too. And the less regulated it is, the more essentially you are allowing a group of um, bankers and other financiers over here to speculate with the rest of your economy, to gamble effectively with our lives and livelihoods. And, you know, the worst consequence that can happen, we saw, well, one of the worst consequences that can happen we saw in 2008, and, and I think many, many people have been saying for a long time now, we're overdue another financial crisis, another financial crash caused by precisely the same sector um, that, that created the crash at that time. And what the British government's looking at doing, it obviously after the 2008 crash, a lot of us spent a lot of time thinking about how you could install a different set of rules that in many ways put the city of London back in its box, put the financial sector back in its box so that it could serve the purpose it was supposed to serve, which is um, providing decent investment um, to the rest of the economy and to households across the country and to some degree the rest of the world. Um, and a, a number of reforms and rules were passed at that time. They didn't go anywhere near far enough in my opinion, but they were something. The so British this, government is net. This is post, this is post um, the um, financial crash mm. and new regulations were in, in place, but and that's what we've got at the moment. And you're yeah. saying we didn't go far enough. Is that a summary of your perspective? We didn't Absolutely. do enough. Absolutely. We didn't, we, we didn't go far enough. And we didn't go far enough because the government was concerned that the financial sector was so overwhelmingly important to our economy that if you go too far in constraining it, 
you you kill the goose that that, that lays the golden egg. Um, now, of course, the answer to that should have been trying to rebalance our economy, trying to invest in other regions, in other areas, um, and in other and in other sectors. Um, and they didn't do that. They failed to do that consistently. And now we've got to the point where, particularly with the complete mess that they've made of Brexit um, and absolute devastation caused to certain bits um, of, of, of industry and farming in our country, they're now doubling down. They're now saying, well, because we failed, because finance is the only thing um, generating uh, any kind of wealth for the country, we better go further and actually begin removing those um, mild reforms that we implemented after the crash. Yeah, and of course, the other problem as well is uh, people from that industry have now got themselves into places of power. I mean, in the case of the, the City of London, many of our uh, viewers will be aware of the Remembrancer who sits in the chamber every day, um, who is a representative of the City of London. And we currently have a hedge fund manager as prime minister. So, you know, it not only is it, they're, they're going to have a bias and, and it's uh, it's not going to be a healthy one as far as that's concerned as well. That's that's a bit of a problem, too, isn't it? That's right. We've got a former, yes, you're right, a former Goldman Sachs banker as the as the prime minister now, which which, of course, creates a bias. That's 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 absolutely um, true. I also think for for, for some folk like um, Rishi Sunak, um, Brexit was always an opportunity to move from being the financial centre of Europe to being the financial centre of um, emerging markets. You know, those parts of the developing world that are growing um, quite rapidly at the moment. Um, and in order to do that, they believe we need to be as, in inverted commas, as competitive as possible. And so strip away all of these awful rules that were forced on us when we were in the European Union to try to create a little um, uh, uh, sense of stability in our economy. Um, and, and, and then we will, you know, we can get back to the proper job of, of, of making money, um, particularly um, from, from um, parts, of Asia, parts of the Asian economy um, and, and growing parts of, um, of Africa's economy too. So um, we, we've got our first question there, Nick. Um, can you see that on screen? Um, has Brexit and the following move to, to, to Paris increased demand for less financial regulation from the UK sector? It has, yes, because, yes, absolutely. The, the, the more stable um, uh, and institutionalised bit of, of bits of the city, um, as the questioner rightly says, have been moving um, to other parts of Europe, including um, Paris, um, but also um, the Netherlands. Um, and so they're saying in order to retain other bits of our financial sector, yes, we need to do what the financiers want, essentially, and let them behave in the way that they want and, and outcompete um, Europe. Now, you know, that, that, that's all very well um, in, in one sense, but in another sense, in order to outcompete Europe, what do you have to do? You have to make that industry less stable so that, you know, the big, the, 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 the big financial institutions have to, have to keep less capital. Um, the speculators have to be less transparent about the way um, that they operate and be able to take more positions on more commodities. Uh, you know, the banker's bonuses have to be allowed uh, to rise. You, you'll remember in the wake of the crash that um, a cap was put on, on banker's bonuses because it was believed that by incentivizing bankers um, to speculate and to make huge amounts of money, you were effectively using bonuses to, to incentivize them to be more risky. And that, that was going to be a risk that was felt by everybody. I mean, bankers can already before we, have. Uh, before we yeah. move on to the, Edi the, Ed the Edinburgh reforms, I think that, you know, that's been really interesting. There. So so your summary is that um, it's already really big and mm. it's already pulling in a huge amount of resources. And I know Karen mentions this quite often, but it, it would be OK if the financial services was a sector like the health service that was saving people's lives or was developing, you know, developing cures or doing something really productive, but actually kind of inherently it's not doing anything that's particularly productive for the UK economy. So it's, it, it's, it's a huge industry, but it's not generating real wealth. It's just, it's just creating financial, financial assets rather than real assets. So that's, so that's the danger. Karen mentioned there the fact that the, 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 um, the, the financial services sector are already in positions of power in Westminster, which again kind of makes that all um, makes it much more kind of together when they're looking to make these decisions. And, and another thing I would add is that um, the financial services sector, it, it, there's, there's very little diversity in the financial services sector. So it is a room of middle-aged um, middle 
or upper class men predominantly making these decisions that are hugely impactful on the UK economy. I think that's a real weakness as well. So you were just moving into the impact that all this has on the UK economy. So we're now in a situation, let's talk about the Edinburgh reforms, rather than pulling back on any of those um, decisions that the government made post 2008 um, to increase regulation. We're looking to do more deregulation. So could you give us a little bit more detail about what's in these Edinburgh reforms? Definitely. So when uh, he introduced them into Parliament, the the, the Chancellor, um, Jeremy Hunt, described them as a Big Bang 2.0. And that's referring um, uh, to um, a, a a huge package of financial deregulation measures from the 1980s called the Big Bang. Um, And that really um, changed the way the financial sector in the city of London worked at that time. Um, It brought in um, a lot more um, American um, private capital. Um, It allowed, I mean, people will remember um, uh, the the kind of greed is good, yuppie culture um, that that almost symbolizes the 1980s um, in some ways when you think about London in the 1980s. Um, that was all tied up with um, these these reforms that were kind of letting finance off, off finance off the leash. So it really and, and many people say, you know, of course that that actually paved the way for the 2008 financial um, crash. Um, it, it really worried us, therefore, when Jeremy Hunt introduced um, these measures into Parliament as saying Big Bang 2.0, um, because um, the very last thing you want. Um, at the moment, especially with the, the kind of phenomenal inequality we already have um, in the UK and indeed around the world, is that kind of is that kind of financial regulation program. He then spelt out a few weeks later exactly what would what would be in um, this this set of reforms, and, and it was a it was a very wide ranging package. There's about thirty proposals in there, um, and in addition to those proposals, there are also there's also separate legislation um, currently in Parliament. Um, but, but by and large, it's a it's a it's a wide ranging program of reforms. Uh, some bits of it, you know, you are, are certainly um, extremely dry and technical. Some bits of it, um, I think, would be deeply unpopular um, if they were if they were better reported um, in the in the national media. For example, one of the things that's drawn um, a lot of attention is removing the so-called ring fencing between um, the ordinary banking that you know, you and me depend upon um, from investment and speculative activity. Um, the, 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 the merging of those things together by the big banks in the in the 80s and 90s was seen as one of the prime drivers of the crisis because it meant increasingly um, that, that the big investment banks could gamble with our money that we depended on, the savings that ordinary people depended on. Um, and so one of the things he's proposing is it, not a complete reversal, but a partial reversal um, of that. Uh, ring fencing, um, new measures on on short selling. I mean, essentially betting on markets going down, which again was 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 a huge mm-hmm. problem in 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 two thousand and eight. You know, speculators um, as a, as a, as a bunch tend to um, adopt a kind of herd mentality, uh, where one of them does something, they get in, they do enjoy getting into a panic, um, and, uh, and 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 often it's that very volatility. Um, which which drives profits. Uh, that, now that volatility may be good for them. But it's not good for the rest of society. Um, so um, that's another you know looking again into allowing these kinds of financial practices that drove the, the financial crash is also really um, really really concerning. Um, also concerning um, a whole range of EU regulations to be to be kind of reviewed and reformed, um, but away from Parliament. You know, which again, the worry there is that ministers can can just basically decide what new laws are um, without having to go back to Parliament again. Um, and there's all manner of things that we're that we're really concerned about in there um, that, 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 that that could possibly happen. Um, but added to that, there is a there is, and of course, there's the banking bonuses um, point, which I already mentioned, which I don't think he actually said in the Edinburgh reforms, but is something they've been committed to for a long time now. Um, I should say, bankers are allowed to get a hundred percent of their salaries paid to them as a bonus, so they can double their salaries as a bonus at the moment, um, and indeed they can have two hundred percent if their shareholders agree. So they're not really struggling um, for bonuses even at the moment. The idea that that's not enough and you need to completely um, scrap. Um, the bankers' bonuses cap is really worrying because, again, that's about incentivizing risky behavior, which is very good um, for your rich investors, but is not very good um, 
for the rest of society. Um, and then in the type of person you want to be encouraging into financial services, you know, you, you want to be encouraging people who are um, risk averse and, and who are going to look after who are going to look after the money that they've got. And this this is a clear evidence that actually it's it's perverse in that sense. They want to incentivize people and to make as much money as possible individually. And that's not directly linked to this the, the the benefit of the economy as a whole so it's really clear isn't it you know what what they're trying to achieve so t taking that extra step nick if you were the if, if you were either a wonderful position to be in or a horrible position to be in but if you were in the government right now what what is the rationale what's their rationale for these um these reforms um that is that essentially and um, our economy is not in a great state to put it mildly um, for lots of different reasons, but one of them is political mismanagement over many years by this government. Another one is, is Brexit. Um, and what on earth do we do about that? How do we, how do we, you know, rev up um, the engine of growth? Um, well, we better, we better, you know, take the take the break off that bit of our economy um, that we're already very dependent upon, um, and let it rip. And indeed, um, some of these some of this uh, some of these proposals are going through Parliament at the moment in a bill called the Financial Services and Markets Bill that my organisation is campaigning on. It's in the House of Lords. There's a there's a Tory Lord in there, and she literally stood up and said, "I don't think these proposals go far enough because, frankly, some of these commodity markets and things that you're deregulating, there's a, an, an awful lot of money to be made. You know, we're a world leader in this kind of stuff. You know, seemingly without." realizing that many people in our society are experiencing a cost of living crisis without realizing the massive inequality that you know the idea that some people are going to make a lot of money from some of these reforms um, and therefore yes it might some of it might show up in your growth figures in your gdp figures but that does not mean we are all sharing in the wealth of that in fact some of them are going to be extremely detrimental to those particularly at the, at, the, at the lower end of society. So I think it comes back down to your, your initial assessment, essentially, which is, you know, they, they feel utterly dependent upon this sector. Um, they don't see, they have no industrial strategy, uh, right? So they have no idea where else growth is going to come from <laughs> across the UK in the next few years. Um, they know they're in trouble. So let's let our friends in the city take their foot off the brake um, and they will be able to generate wealth. And of course, you know, that all sounds very nice when they say it on the news and you think, well, we need, yes, we need some growth in this country and so on. But actually, growth is not shared equally in an economy, that, especially in an economy as dependent on financial services as ours is. Yeah. I mean, what's incredible, Nick, is um, to the three of us, this sounds eerily familiar. Didn't we try this? You know, didn't we try this in the 1980s and into the 90s? And isn't this the source of so many of the problems that we have in society at the moment? And and, and the fact that we're now looking at um, almost like you know this kind of zombie state is just trying to just trying to re-energize it again to try and get something out of it. I mean, it is that definition of madness, isn't it? That you know we're trying the same thing to expect a different outcome. Well, that's what we would hope. But I think the outcome that the, the government want is the same outcome as they had in the 1980s and the 1990s, that some people were incredibly wealthy. And I just think this idea that actually the narrative is that they're looking to increase growth, but really they're just looking at they're looking at the ways to to, to um, um, you know grease the palms of the, the people who are supporting them in, in power. And I think there's a huge amount of evidence for that. I don't think there's much evidence that this is going to have any kind of positive impact so what's the likely impact of these reforms if you were to go a few years um, in the future and and everything had been passed and we were in a new kind of deregulated world um what do you think the impact would be on the let's start with the uk economy but if you could look a little bit broader as well to that uh i think in the uk very simply a more centralized more unequal country um with uh ever more economic weight attached to London and, and the southeast of England, um, ever more money being made by people in the, in the top income brackets, um, and, and, and life getting harder um, for those at the bottom, for whom, you know, the prospect essentially for many, many people is, you know, you work in the service industry serving some of these people. You know, I mean, that's, that's the kind of vision of, of, of economy I think they've got. And I think you're absolutely right. You've almost got 
you've, we've almost got a zombie government now, really. Uh, it's deeply unpopular. Um, it doesn't have very much legitimacy. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's never, I, I don't remember a, a, a time um, since, since the 90s, really, where people were crying out for change as much. And yet they are ramming through, you know, measure after measure, reform after reform, which are essentially aiming to give, you know, their donors and their mates um, more power and more control um, and the ability to generate more wealth. So that, that's my concern for the UK. Uh, maybe if on a global scale, I can I can actually answer it with an example um, of, of one of the reasons we got involved in this in the first place, which is one of the things that the government's trying to do with its financial services and markets bill is free up um, commodity markets um, to in, in a way that will allow more speculative capital to flow in and more money to be made by traders. Now, let me first just quickly explain what commodity markets are. So this is where you essentially sell futures, derivatives in um, basic commodities. So it could be wheat, it could be rice, uh, could be nickel, uh, could be oil or gas, um, right? Basic commodities. And the reason for these markets existing is, say you're a farmer, um, it's a pretty precarious living. Um, when I plant my grain crop, I don't know what I'm going to get in a, a year's time when I, when I harvest it. Um, so what you do, you sell, you, you sell a future, what's called a future um, on that. Um, and so you say, okay, I'm, I'm guaranteed this price and I'm happy with that. Um, and the buyer can do the same at the other end. And the idea is in the middle, there is risk. And that risk is taken by speculators, essentially. So you need a few speculators in the market to do this. Now, this isn't the only way of providing farmers with security, but it's the way that we decided is, <laughs> is, 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 is most appropriate in <laughs> financial markets, right? So you can see a rationale for them existing. The problem is these markets were radically deregulated in the end of the 90s. And what that meant is, Big investment banks like Goldman Sachs poured money into these markets, so much money that they actually started affecting the underlying price of the commodity itself. And you may remember 2008 to 2010, there was a horrendous um, spike in food prices. Many countries, are, I mean, many people say it was the thing that sparked the um, Arab uprisings uh, in North Africa. Um, the Haitian government fell. Countries that were very dependent on imported food, people simply couldn't afford it anymore because the price had risen so much, not because there was any shortage of food in the world, but because there was so much speculative capital chasing the derivatives on that food that they were starting to affect the prices. And so we campaigned for, for better rules, better regulation, and, and we won them, not what we would have liked, but a, but a mild version that, that introduced some transparency and some control to these markets. The government now wants to strip away those controls again as part of its financial deregulation package. I just find this extraordinary at a time when we are experiencing a massive cost of living rise here in the UK, that same cost of living crisis, high food prices are affecting people right the way around the world. And the government is saying, we're gonna give speculators more power to speculate on the basics of the global economy. And that's just one of the ways I think that these packages can create a more unstable, more volatile, more financialized world market. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, we really know what this is. This is the elites. Bed, feathering their beds. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. I mean, anyone with half a brain can see that. Um, it's what do you do about it? And Laurie McFarlane, when he was on The Economist, Scottish Economist, said it really succinctly that the UK seemed to think that it was going to get rich from us all buying and selling each other's houses. And, <laughs> you know, this, this kind of, you know, juggling with money, you know, it might, it might bring you a better GDP figure that is a politician you could stand up and say, oh, look at my GDP. I think more people are, are wising up to GDP and how insufficient it is as a measure of your country's real success, because people can see, yeah, that that's yeah, that's we've got more GDP. But how is that affecting life round about me? And in the UK, you know, we really, really have a very from you know, from top to bottom, a very unequal country, and, and I think people can are starting to see through that now. And I think a lot of younger people as well who are very concerned about the climate crisis are just asking, you know, growth is that a good thing? So it's, I think also as well, these conservative politicians they're behind the curve intellectually, and I think um, the, the you know that there is a rising uh, growth in the population who understand that, and I think that's part of the reason that they will be ousted eventually, hopefully. 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, Oxfam did a report recently where it, it looked at, you know, the growth in wealth just in the last year and, and, and who'd gained from that. And it was almost all the top elite, you know, they, they get the top 1% had, had gained something like 1% of that growth. So, you know, even if you're saying that should play a role in the economy, you know, the, you, need to, you need to regulate, you need to tax, you need to think about how these resources are going to be properly invested if you actually want it to be, to be fair, um, to build a fairer society. And that's absolutely the opposite. Um, of of what they're doing here, so uh, yes, agree. Of course, they are, they are saying that they're going to be benefiting jobs and yeah. every part of the you know. So there's definitely. I actually found a couple of stats earlier when I was I was looking at some some stuff for this, and um, although the financial services sector has grown substantially over recent decades, it employs the same number of people uh, and a smaller proportion of the UK workforce than it did 30 years ago. So this idea that it's growing and everyone's getting a job, and obviously, you know, if if if, if any of you have, have looked at how trades are made or how FX is, you know, how how the, but it's all computers, it's all technology. There's actually not that many people. So again, this says that it's creating all these jobs. Well, there's little evidence that the growth in the financial services sector has actually created that. And also, interestingly, in in, in 2010. The um, tax revenue from financial services was 70 billion, which is a substantial amount. Um, but 10 years later, it was under 50 billion. So even when it's growing, we're receiving less of that money back in tax and we're receiving uh, and there's not as many jobs. So when you're looking at the statements from the from the chancellor, there's not really a lot of substance behind that. To, to evidence that that's what's happening. That's what's happening. And we've got a question, Nick. I'd love you to. I'd love to kind of come back on that because it looked like you were a bit surprised by that. That there's not the jobs that you know you would just expect. It is a big sector, absolutely, but it's not growing in anywhere in relation to the amount of of, of money that it's earning. And um, here's a question for you: If an independent Scotland was to enter the EU, would our financial services be regulated from the EU, or would we need to regulate our own market here? Thanks for that. So, yeah, so there, there are um, EU regulations on finance. Um, and I guess if an independent Scotland were to, were to enter um, the EU, they would need to abide by those regulations. But they don't they don't cover everything. Um, so, you know, I, I think it is well worth any country um, thinking through how it makes its financial sector work for the people of that country and its economy. I mean, that should be the number one priority. Um, not simply letting it off its leash to do what it wants. You know, finance is there for a reason. Um, and we haven't seen it like that in the UK for a long time. And I would definitely hope that an independent Scotland would would take a different view. So, yes, there would, of course, there would be, if you were to enter the EU, there would be a set of, of regulations and standards, um, like the ones I've been talking about, the, 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 the ones we've won on the commodity markets, that was actually EU regulation. I mean, the British government, um, of course, argued against virtually any financial regulation when we were in the EU um, that was introduced. They argued against the bankers bonus cap and, 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 and lots more besides. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, in, 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 in embrace the, 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 the rules there are. But I think thinking through how finance can work for your country, for your economy, is one of the key things that politicians need to do. And unfortunately, we've got a government in Westminster um, that rather asks what can what can your country and your economy do for the financial sector and the financiers in it? No, that that's a really important point, and um, we're, we're going to have a real detailed conversation with Stuart Hosey about that and the pre, kind of prudential regulation. And if Scotland does become independent, then it, it's able to set to to a large degree these things themselves. However, they have to align with kind of global rules along capital adequacy and uh, and another kind of you know the. the the kind of globally agreed way that, that you manage financial services. So there, there, there's there's not a huge amount of sovereignty within that. Um, but you can, you know, you can set up a central bank and you can ask it to regulate very differently compared to other uh, jurisdictions. Nick, I had a specific question around capital adequacy. Mm -hmm. um, within these, um, what, capital adequacy basically says to a bank, you have to have a certain amount of your capital set aside to cover any of your risky investments. And these these were increased over longer. It was, a, I think, it was BAL what was the type of regulation that came in to increase this. And um, the um, Edinburgh reforms are they looking to increase the amount of um, capital that banks hold to limit the risk? 
keep it the same or looking to reduce that amount? <laughs> reduce it, unsurprisingly, uh, particularly on the insurance um, sector. Mm. So one of the things they're saying is after the crash, we kind of overdid it um, and we expected um, these companies to, um, to hold too much um, capital um, in case of risk. Um, and actually, we could release some of that and that could be used to invest in the real economy. Now, there may well be a case that the amount of capital um, insurance companies currently hold is is too much. I mean, some of this is not a, you know, I know people like to say economics is a science. I don't, don't believe it's a science. Um, there's no exact right answer to this stuff. So you could look at that, but the gov- there's absolutely nothing to suggest and there's nothing in the regulation or the reforms to say that these companies with the capital that's freed up will invest in a useful part of the economy. More likely than not, this is going to end up as additional capital in the back of shareholders' pockets. Because what these companies have tended to do more and more and more in our very financialized economy is return often more than they make in a year to their shareholders in dividends and buybacks and so on. There's absolutely no reason to assume that if we free this money up, it's going to do something useful. So I think there's two worries. One is, are they right that actually the capital requirements are too large? If not, um, it's extremely dangerous. Um, to, 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 to make this move um, because you're looking at potentially systemic risk and too big to fail institutions failing again, like they did in 2008. Secondly, if you decide it, it is too large um, and actually we could, we could free it up a bit, then for goodness sake, put the rules in place to ensure that something's actually, something useful is actually going to be done with that investment. It isn't simply going to be siphoned off and end up in tax havens. Mm-hmm. Well, well, you've covered that. That again with the narrative is that there'll be. I think the figure is a hundred billion that'll be that'll be available. Um, the narrative is that that will go into the economy. But as we've discussed, the actual underlying reason is to increase the shareholders' uh, returns for these for these companies. But it'll have a huge impact, as you said. So the, if if you hold a less less amount of capital, um, then you have got a riskier balance sheet. Effectively, yeah. you you can't you you can't. Um, you can't protect yourself as well against any losses for any of the risky assets you hold if your assets are reduced. Now, this reminds me of some of the reading I've been doing recently, uh, a famous economist called Hyman Minsky. Nick, have you come across him before? I have. I have. Yes, I remember. I remember back in 2008 when we had the crash, suddenly everybody was talking about Minsky and reading Minsky and uh, they'd they'd rediscovered him (laughs) because he seemed very relevant for the time. Yeah. Well, um, it's interesting because, you know, we often hear and, and the mainstream narrative is that no one predicted the 2008 financial crash. And this has almost become, uh, it, it's been said so often that people just believe it. Well, actually, anyone who was aware of Hyman Minsky was saying, we're in a situation now, we can see quite clearly that we're going to enter a period where we could have what's called a Minsky moment, where it just gets to such an extent that the government really can't bail it out um, to any kind of meaningful um, way without dramatically changing the market. And that's what happened in, in 2008. Um, do, do you think we are close to that kind of moment again, as we're kind of, you know, mo- moving, you know, 15 years? Do you think we're at a point where maybe we've had a kind of collective amnesia and we've really forgotten yeah. why we put all these regulations in place? Do you know what? I'm, I'm really pleased you're, you're focusing this show on this topic because I've been astonished how little the media has been interested in the government's regular dereg, financial deregulation, how little politicians have been interested. And it does just seem like we've all forgotten what happened 15 years ago. And, you know, these crashes um, are I mean, we didn't do enough in the first place to prevent it happening again. The idea we're now stripping away some of this stuff. Some of these rules have only been in place for a few years because it took quite a long time to get them through parliaments. And, you know, so we've only had them in in place a few years. The idea we're now stripping them away again because everything's fine, I think is crazy. And some of the stuff that I, I talked about earlier in terms of the commodity markets, many people are now saying, you know, there are trillions of dollars or pounds in assets in these markets being traded away and derived, this could easily this could easily pr- provoke the next crash. I mean, there is so much fictitious money out there circling around that our pensions are invested in, that insurance companies are invested in, that the banks are invested in, um, and it, it, it's terrifying. And, and you, you mentioned the alg- algorithmic trading earlier, which again adds a new level of um, risk 
um, because some of the some of the trades happen so unbelievably quickly. Um, so yes, I do. I'm 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 extremely worried about it. And you know, we, we've already got um, a, a, a welfare state kind of on its knees. Our our, our pensions are invested um, in, in extremely risky um, um, projects in many cases, extremely risky um, uh, ventures. It's, it's terrifying. And the idea that you want to open that up to more risk at the moment, I think is, I think is really, is really crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, just to give a little bit of detail on, on that, because I agree completely, but um, um, Minsky's um, financial instability hypothesis was that at some point, the um, private sector balance sheets become so indebted that the economy collapses. And when we look at 2008, the UK, the US economy had just over 100% of GDP as household debt. So 100%. It now it's got round about 80%. So it's not as overly leveraged as it was as 2008. But I've got a question for our audience now. Does it? Would anyone like to guess at what the UK um, household debt ratio is to GDP? So it was 100 when the financial crash happened in the US, or the US debt ratio, and it was around about 80% now. Anyone got any thoughts on what it is in the UK at this very moment? So I'll, I'll come back to that. Now, the, what also tends to happen is, Nick, that when um, household debts are expanding, governments are going through a, a period of austerity. So there's less money going into the economy and there's more pressure being put on the private sector. And that's, again, what's happening at the moment with this whole austerity yeah. narrative. So it's almost like we're on the edge and you have governments who are not wanting to spend any government surplus. They're wanting to, to um, pull back on their deficit and spend less spend less money. Um, and that's yeah. impacting the, the private sector. So... This well, is what happened with Clinton in the early two, 2000s, in the 90s and the early 2000s. So it seems like we're really, a, it's a real mirror image of what happened, um, you know, as a lead up to the financial crisis. I mean, unleashing huge amounts of debt into the economy is a great way of papering over the cracks of inequality in your society, essentially, because households that can no longer afford to live a reasonable standard of life, um, but can take on debts, will take on that debt, you know, however unsustainable um, it may be in the long term. So, it, it, yes, you're absolutely right. It's, it, it just seems to be it, it's coming around in a cycle again. And we need to be really vigilant about this. And I think you're right. Make the links with austerity, um, because um, the way that, that the financial sector has behaved in this country has absolutely been to um, to, to, to gamble on on people, you know, pe pe people having a, a basic, dignified, good standard of living. Um, and we have a government, I think, in many ways that, that doesn't believe in, in governing. It doesn't believe in government. It has this 19th century laissez-faire idea, you know, that the, the market will, will provide. You just, you just take your hands off and you let the market do what the market does um, and, and everything will be OK. And it's it's. Uh, our society is at absolute crisis point now. And the idea that you are still, that you're doing more of that, that you're taking us further down that path um, is, is frightening. Well, well, we've had a couple of, uh, absolutely, we've had a couple of answers. We've got 102% <laughs> um, and 150%. And what's worked out really, the wisdom of crowds, um, it's right in the middle of that. Um, the, 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 the UK's uh, household debt to GDP is over 130%. So it's huge. We often talk about, and if you think about the amount of media coverage of the government debt mm. and the government's deficit and, and how much it has to pay back and how worried everyone is about it, compare that to how much coverage there is of what actual household debt is. And that's the, the, look, that's the, that's the balance that people have to pay off by earning more money. The government balance is very different because the government can pay that off by printing money because it's the issuer of our currency. Whereas you, me, Karen, and everyone watching, we know we have to pay off our debts by earning more and going into much more difficult situations to, to be able to do that. So it, it's fascinating and, and well done the audience getting that between the between the two of you. Um, Nick, um, thanks very much for, for, for joining us and, and especially for saying, you know, it's a topic that needs to be covered 
a lot more because we absolutely we absolutely believe that. And and as Scotland moves, hopefully progressively towards independence these are the areas where i think our, our, our leaders our, our bankers and um, people like you we can sit down and we can see how can we do this differently what can we learn yeah. because what seems to be really clear from the united kingdom and how it's managed its financial services and its economy no one ever learns from the mistakes in the past you know regulators get lazy and forget borrowers lenders economists government and we end up with financial crisis again. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Nick. Uh, I really That's my fun, pleasure. Uh, 45 minutes. Thanks so much, Nick. Bye for now. Bye. Well, that was fascinating, wasn't it, Karen? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, I think this uh, uh, that the people that we've had in government for a long time are not interested in running the country as, uh, to make it successful, I think they're running it to make them successful, <laughs> or you know that you, you know it's yeah. there's, there's no evidence to, in my mind that they're they're trying to make the UK a success. No, I agree completely, and as we, as we covered a couple of times there, there is a narrative that we're doing this for growth. You know, when you look at privatisation as a perfect example, privatisation was all about the narrative was making things much more efficient so everyone would get much better services. But really, all it was was about stripping the commons of resources and being able to learn from them for, and being able to earn from them if you are already wealthy. So um, nothing seems to change. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we are so supportive of Scottish independence, because hopefully there is a chance to do things differently. Um, thanks again to Nick for joining us. Um, thanks very much for one of our, um, for Hashby dropping up our dates of our Festival of Economics. Um, tickets are available and we've got a wonderful programme. It's almost finished now. Uh, you can find that on the Scotonomics uh, website. Uh, as soon, Nick's not left our green room, so I'm going to see if he's going to come up, to, if he's interested in coming up to Dundee for that. Um, I'll let you know what he says and if he's available. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this evening. And we'll see you next week. Good night.